Aubrey, welcome to This Is Horror as part of the House of Bad Memories weekend. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, it's um, it's an early start for me today, but uh, ready to ready to answer any of your sort of deeper, meaningful questions this morning. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna kick off with one that I often like to ask and I, I mean it's maybe a bit harsh for before 6am but I want to know what early life lessons did you learn growing up? Um, I learned that if you want to get something done the only person that's going to get it done is yourself um, and it's it's a philosophy that I carry with me to this day in that if you want to do something, you have to do something. You can't expect, you can't sort of dream about wanting to be, for example, wanting to be a, a voice actor or a singer or a, a you know, a, a, a great um, athlete. The only way that's, that's going to happen is if you put in a lot of hard work. Um, I was, as a, as a, as a, as a youngster, um, I had a hard time in school. I was I was a ginger. Um, I, I d never had the best of health when I was younger, so I was kind of picked on all the time. So it was, you know, but the only person that could could get through that was me. Mm. Uh, and I think in in the long term that makes you know what happens to you in, in when you're when you're a kid affects you for the rest of your life and makes you the person that you are. And you can either sort of give up or you can dust yourself down and um, kick your own backside. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that realisation, uh, when, when, when I was a youngster, uh, I wanted to be an actor or a singer. And I remember going to my careers teacher in school when I was about 14 or 15 and saying, saying as such and him looking at me and saying don't be so stupid boy there's no possibility that that's ever going to happen you can go and work in a printer's and that that was the attitude um but I was a stubborn little sod and it, even though I went through life doing various jobs that I hated I eventually ended up doing what I love um so that's purely by you know if you want to get something done you've got to do something so I guess that's it <laughs> yeah yeah I, it's a good life lesson to learn and particularly at such an early age I mean that doesn't sound like it was ideal circumstances and how you learned it but no, I mean no. it but it is that it's that you know it's that saying that you quite often hear um you know what doesn't kill us make us makes us stronger mm. and in a way, um, you know, discipline was different when I was younger. Now, now it's slow. Like, well, we'll sit the child down and we'll give them. A, we'll we'll try to explain to them so that they understand what they've done is wrong. You know, if I was, if I was, if I was, a, or when I was a youngster, if you were to stick your hand in a fire because we're curious and that's the kind of silly things that we do, you get a slap, and that and that was like, oh. OK, I understand that I shouldn't do that. And it's short, sharp. You know, I'm, I'm not advocating corporal punishment, but, you know, it. and I, I really feel like an old man saying this, but it never did me any harm right. in the long run. Um, and I do wonder how youngsters these days um, are being brought up with the uh the 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 whole thing of, of, of they 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 all act as though they're privileged as though the world owes them a favor and if somebody says something to upset them you know it's oh you can't say that and all of a sudden there's people rushing around to comfort them and i'm thinking in, you know in the real world people say and do nasty things and you have to brush yourself down and get on with it um otherwise you're just going to sort of implode or or sit on your own in a room all day worried about what somebody might say to you so um that that whole philosophy of if you want to get something done you've got to do something it, it, it's all connected with that um mm, to take it back to to the voice acting and this kind of lesson of doing you know 
you have to do the work if you want something to happen. I'm yeah. wondering, when did you get your first job either within voice acting or creative endeavors? When was that and how did that come about? Well, I was, um, like I said, I always wanted to be an actor or a, or a singer. So um, when I, even when I was sort of six, I think I joined my, I, I was a singer for 35 years. Um, and I joined my first band when I was 16. Um, I still keep in touch with uh, all the, the guys from that band now. And um, I kind of went through life, like I said, I had to, I had to have proper jobs, obviously, to, to, to pay for things, because um, trying to become a full-time musician at that age, it just wasn't viable. There wasn't enough work around. And you either became, you know, famous, and, and earned loads of money, or you were a jobbing, gigging musician, and I was the latter. Um, I remember one morning waking up when I was 22 years old and thinking, I'm never going to be a pop star because I'm too old now. I'm past it. You know, the opportunity has gone. Um, and and that, was, that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> um, but then I just carried on gigging um, and it wasn't until I was in my um, early 30s that I'd been in. I'd worked in a number of jobs in, in the music industry and I was a computer programmer. I, I was a tour guide on top of a bus. I did all sorts of jobs. Um, I, and that, then I was working in radio. Um, I was a, a, a news editor, a news presenter. And I just thought, do you know what? I don't want to be getting up at four o'clock in the morning to present the news I had enough uh, and I was still gigging so I was getting in very late getting up very early so I decided to jack everything in much much to the chagrin of my wife at the time and become a full-time musician and I poured all my energies into it and I wish I'd done that when I was in my early 20s because I think I'd be in a very different position now because by Forcing myself into a situation where I had to find work, had to find gigs, had to rehearse. What it did was it made me very, very good at my job because unless you were brilliant and you were a big fish in a small pond and unless you stood out above everybody else, you just wouldn't get the work. So it just pushed me and pushed me to um, be the best at what I did. And I, I did it for a long time, like I said, about in total about 35 years from, you know, when I was part gigging part time to, to right through to full time. And I was sometimes doing six, seven, eight gigs a week, never seeing my family, traveling all over Europe, which was nice, but it's work. Um, and not long before COVID, I just, my body just went, I can't do this anymore. I was exhausted. I was so tired. And I still wasn't making the kind of money that I wanted to be making. So I took the decision to jack it in and, mm. and stop being a full-time gigging uh, singer. And I thought, what can I do um, that still involves those talents and acting that I've, that I've always loved? And I thought, I was listening to a lot of audio books at the time. And I thought, I can do that. I'm sure I can do that. So I sat down and went through uh, the lengthy process of teaching myself how to be an audio book narrator and a voice actor. Mm -hmm. uh, over during COVID, um, because I have some health issues, which meant I'd, I'd left the marital home. Um, I was I was in a house in the countryside with a with a, um, a room converted into a studio, and there was nothing else to do because I was completely isolated from everyone else because because of this condition that I've got, um, and it meant I had to I all I could do was work and and practice and learn how to become a voice actor. Um, so it was just it was just sort of I suppose just before and during COVID that this the, this whole change of direction took place mm -hmm. and i 
started um, auditioning for audiobooks. At the time, I wasn't looking so much at additional voiceover work like commercials and narration and that kind of thing. That that came as a as a natural sort of side um, uh, side element. Um, but I happened to, to to do an audition for an author who was who had also been through a big transition in his life, um, and he'd he'd uh, he'd got divorced, and he was he was literally on his on his backside financially. Um, but he had some author friends that said to him, "Look, crime writing is where it's at, right? Mm. Crime, crime readers are." Crime and horror readers are voracious. They they can't get enough. You write a book and they want immediately want another one. So uh, this this guy started uh, writing this series of books, and and I happened to audition and get the get the first book, and um, they just absolutely took off. Um, and it was that that then allowed me to take the money that I was earning from the book sales and reinvest it into retraining. Mm. Um, and so, so for four years, I've been, um, although I've been working as, a, as an audiobook narrator, I've been able to take, you know, invest the majority of the money that I've earned back into the business um, so that I can learn more. Because I still have this philosophy that if you want to be successful in any business, You've got to stand out above everybody else. And when you do that, and when you're seen as an expert, and when and when people can see that you're being successful, that just leads to more work because people want a piece of it. Um, so I, that's a very long answer to a very <laughs> short question, but that's where I am now. Um, and it's, in fact, it's opened up this whole world of voiceover and acting um and weirdly as a result i've now started getting tv work um and some film work and which has involved singing and voiceover um because i i now have a, a, a theatrical agent um because i was sort of i got some small bit parts um doctor who for example um and that that hasn't been aired yet, but that immediately led to me getting an agent, which then led to other work. And I, like last week, I was working on a new series for Channel Four called Generation Z, which is about my favourite subject, which is zombies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I got to be in a zombie for a zombie series. Um, not, not a big part, but it, you know, um, it, it's 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 all led to now. To, to the way things are going so um so the the journey continues you know i'm constantly learning every day um and i and i get some great training from uh, a voiceover company in the uk called richcraft um and they've they've taught me a lot a hell of a lot in fact so um yeah i think i think any anybody who's an expert in their field will will say they they never stop learning and you don't you know mm. it's, i think it's uh what's the old saying it's a it's a wise man who knows he's not a wise man so you you just have to just keep going you know <laughs> when you're going through hell keep going oh, i think your video <laughs> has cut out there Oh, have we had a glitch? I, I, I think like it cut out. You you said you never stop learning and then boom. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it cut. Shall I, will, shall I, will, I mean, all I said was you 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 never stop learning. And when you're, uh, you know, a, a wise man is only wise because he knows he's not a wise man. And um, I think it was Churchill that said, you know, when you're going through hell, keep going. Mm. Uh, so it's uh, you. You can't. You can. You can never rest on your laurels in any. Yeah. Business, I think um, this one being no exception. So. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there, there's so many directions I could now take the conversation. I'm almost spoiled <laughs> for choice. But I mean, you you obviously 
self-taught a lot of the lessons for audiobook narration in the space of four years. So I'm wondering for people listening who are perhaps looking to get into that kind of work, are there any big do's and don'ts or lessons that you wish you'd just been given or told at the start? Yeah. I thought I could teach myself. Um, and I did for a long time. There's a number of websites out there. There, there are hundreds of people out there that will tell you they can teach you how to be a voice actor. Most of them have only ever done a little bit of voice acting themselves and then have gone, I'll, I'll teach other people. A side hustle, they call it nowadays, don't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's, there, there's, there's a website called Gravy for the Brain, which is um, which was set up um, by a guy called uh, Peter Dickinson. And Peter Dickinson is the voice of X Factor. He's the guy, right? Um, and, and you hear his voice all over the place in the UK. And he does X Factor US and uh, or, or America's Got Talent. And he's, they've got this great website um, with, with all of these videos and techniques and learning. And they have a conference every year. So I did that. For, for a long time and was teaching myself and the best advice I can give to anybody if they want to get into this business don't do that <laughs> find a good tutor find somebody that's well respected um that knows what they're doing not not at you know and they and they don't come cheap but there's a reason for that it's because they're very good and they get great results and Although I was doing um, audiobooks and, and, you know, doing okay with them, um, it was only earlier this year, actually, that I started having training that I was, that I was paying for. Um, most of it is, is on uh, online one-to-one, -one, just like we're doing now. Um, some of it is face-to-face. -face. Next week, I'm up in London for, for a course. And the difference that made was like... Um, you start freewheeling, where, where, whereas you're sort of slowly slogging your way uphill, trying to, trying to, you know, do auditions and get jobs. All of a sudden, you have all these techniques in your arsenal, and you freewheel, and the jobs just, you know, it makes a huge difference. So if anyone is thinking of getting into voiceover, yes, there are loads of resources on the internet, but get training of somebody because they will hear things in your voice that you can't. Um, with the best ear in the world, you might think you sound fantastic. But in reality, if somebody else, if you have a third party that really knows what they're doing, they can just give you all these little pointers that will take you from being an okay um, uh, narrator or voice actor to a, to a brilliant one that everybody wants to use. So that's my advice. Training. Get training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... I mean, you were talking about, obviously, you want to stand out because, I mean, it, it, it is quite a, it, it, almost an overcrowded market, really, all the narrators oh, out yeah. there. So, yeah. I mean, I'm wondering what you are specifically doing to stand out. I mean, for, from my perspective and from speaking with David Moody, one thing that was like a really good selling point is, Aubrey can pretty much do any accent you want. <laughs> and like, you know, I, I've worked with a number of narrators before and y your range is wider than pretty much anyone that I've worked with. So it is that kind of one of your intentional unique selling points? And what, what else, you know, are you doing to stand out in an oversaturated market? You're right. It is it is absolutely an oversaturated market. And in addition to that, AI has now reared its ugly head. Mm. Um, one of the reasons um, the the uh, actors and writers strike that has been taking place in the US is because of AI. People are very very worried that their voices are being cloned, um, and it's affecting the 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 gen <clears throat> the overall price. Excuse me. <clears throat> the overall pricing of voiceover is lowering it. Um, so to stand out, 
you have to be exceedingly good at what you do, but also exceedingly good at everything to do with voiceover. So, yeah, a- accents and character voices are they're all part and parcel of of being an actor, really. You know, when I was when I was growing up, it was silly voices all the time and um, impersonating people. And that that is absolutely carried forward into my voiceover narration. Um, with accents, it's a case of you need to listen. Um, people try and do various accents without practicing them, and consequently, you, you know, the classic one is is people trying to do a Welsh accent, and they end up sounding like someone from the, you know, from the Indian continent. It's, it, it's, it always amuses me that. Um, that happens, but uh, it's um, I've I've had various bits of training, especially for um, the U.S. accent and regional U.S. accents, because obviously th- there is a general American accent, which is what you'll generally hear news readers and and uh, pre- uh, TV presenters in the U.S. using this general accent that everybody can understand. It's like RP English. Um, mm. But then, of course, you've got all the regions. Um, my my partner um, uh, comes from Kentucky, um, so she has. But she lives in Ireland, so she she has quite a quite a soft, you know, it's a softened Southern American accent with a hint mm. of Irish in it. And you know, I try to sometimes. I hope she doesn't see this. But I, I, you know, I sometimes try and, and and get her accent and impersonate it, not not with, not in front of her, but because it's a practice, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, here's a classic example. I auditioned uh, recently for a for a gaming job. I now do a lot of gaming voiceovers, and it the the brief was uh, you are a um, warrior blacksmith. So I auditioned. And I thought, right, I'm going to be a big Welsh warrior blacksmith. So I did this audition with this very strong Welsh accent. I'm here today to slay some bloody dragons. And I went into um, uh, the studios in in Soho. And the, the, the director was there. And down the line, one was in California. um, One was in, I don't know where the other one was but were, were the two writers of the game. And then I had a, a, a director and a producer in the studio with me. And I said, right, so uh, you want the, uh, you want the Welsh, uh, the, the Welsh warrior version? Actually, Aubrey, um, we're, we're thinking, we're thinking Scottish. So I was like, oh, okay, Scottish. So I go in the booth and I, open my mouth and I'm like, hey, we're going to slay some dragons today, are you? No, I mean, yeah. really giving it, you know, full on heavy sort of Glaswegian Scottish. And the vo- little voice down the line said, actually, Aubrey, I was wondering if you could give the character a slightly more Edinburgh accent. And I thought, oh, great. One of these guys is actually Scottish and they're asking me to do a Scottish accent. So I said, oh, uh, okay. So you mean... Less Billy Connolly and more David Tennant. That's exactly what I mean. So, uh, you know, I had to flick very quickly and change. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only way you can you can do, you know, accents don't come naturally because you have your own accent. Mine is mostly very generic, my normal accent, with a slight hint of Welsh because I'm Welsh. Um, but that gives me... Uh, um, a flat base to put other accents on top of, um, and then the, the 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 character voices quite often come from the accent. You know, um, I mean, in 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 H- House of Bad Memories, the the, the you know the, the the main baddie is mm. is a brummy, and you know, I just imagine this. You, you have you have to. You know, I will always say to uh, authors, g- give me a character sheet. Mm. Let me know who the characters are. Give me a little bit of background. It doesn't have to be anything massive, but are they? Is there anything wrong with them? Are they? Have they? Have they had a bad life? Are they? You know, what kind of person are they? 
And from that, you can then imagine their voice. And that just, that comes in your head. It's a question I get asked all the time. Where do the voices come from? And unfortunately, the voices are in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and they form, and they form a life of their own. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I love accents and I love doing characters. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in that respect. Not all narrators do that. And not all narrators will um, change their voices for the characters. They just do straight reads. A lot of, I've noticed, a, you know, quite a few American um, audiobook narrators, they just do straight reads. Um, but I find that boring. You know, uh, books were always um, originally were, were meant to be read out loud. Because if you had a village of of a hundred people, probably only one person would be able to read, and it was, and they would read the stories out to people, and that's what books were written for. And if you read a book without moving your lips, it was actually the you know the church would think that you were possessed in some way. It was it was really seen as as being weird and strange and not right. So even monks. When they were when they were reading scripts, had to move their lips or whisper mm. as they were reading. Otherwise, it was like you know you were the devil incarnate. Um, so, you know, books were always meant to be read out loud, and anybody can read a book like a menu and just read the words that are there, which is pretty much what AI does. You know, AI can't mm. put in or certainly can't at the moment, but it can't put in that. You know, if somebody's dying or if they're crying or if they're upset or if they just made love, AI can't put that emotion into the voice. I'm sure it will do one day. But, you know, a human can do that and a human can express that emotion. And, and that's what I think being an audiobook narrator is all about. It's, getting a, it's turning those words um, on the page into words that people hear where they can conjure these images and feel the emotions in their head, you know, in their, in their being. And mm. that goes for, you know, romance, horror, crime, whatever, every genre, you know, you, it, the, the great narrators are the ones that can really, you can listen to it and not even think you're listening to a book. You know, it's, you, it's somebody's telling you a story, but they're not reading it. They're performing it, um, and it, and that's something that I that I always try and do. It's it's hard, but it gets gets results. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean one reason that I always make sure that I have an audio book version of my books is because I'm a great fan, a listener, or a reader of audio books. So, like you know. It's a growing market as well. I think that it is an investment for the future. And to me, if you don't have the audiobook version, you are leaving money on the table. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and I, I, I still... Um, so there's Amazon, uh, as you know, Amazon have a um, their own Kindle store and their own bookstore. Which is which is brilliant because it it allows now people to to self publish. Whereas before it was very difficult to get a book published, and the res, and the returns were awful. Um, people seem to think that if you if you sell a book through a publishing house, you're going to make loads of money. No, oh, they take all the money. They give you a tiny percentage. With with places like Amazon and and Findaway Voices, which are the platforms that that most authors now use, you get a much better return on your on your book sale um but also there's the mechanism there to allow you to um have have an audiobook created and and look for other uh, narrators uh, which is the process um how we met um for anybody watching this they they probably wouldn't realize that if an author isn't based in the UK or the US or uh, Australia, I think it I think is. Me, yeah, and like I think I think Ireland as well. Yeah, and Ireland. Mm. If you're not based in those countries, you can't um, get your audiobook produced through Amazon. 
It's all mm. to do with tax. It's yeah. Tax. It's a pain in the backside. Um, but there are alternatives like Find Away Voices, which is another distribution network. Um, but on there, you can you can find all these these voiceover actors and, and mm. match them up with with the authors. Um, and it, and it's really important. So I quite often I will look at, for example, the 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 best selling top best selling fifty crime novels that are currently on Amazon, and I'll go through all of them. And I go, who hasn't got an audio book? And when I find a book that doesn't have an audio book with it, I'll get in touch with the author and I'll say, you haven't got an audio book. This book needs an audio It must have an audio book. You know? And then you, mm. it's a sales technique, but you pitch yourself and send them a demo. And, uh, uh, and that's, you know, I've been successful doing that. I'm surprised more people don't, don't do it. You've got to be proactive. Yeah. Uh, and that's the same with you as, a, as an author. You, you know how important it is books just don't sell themselves you, right. you have to be prepared to put in the 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 legwork for the for the for the marketing of the book um yeah eventually if, if a book is good enough it will create its own momentum but to get it out there you've got to work hard yeah yeah and of course i mean word of mouth is so important too and of course like we, we mentioned him before but it was david moody saying like look i yeah. you know he, he said he had like a great struggle for many books finding a good narrator and then when he connected with you it was like yes now yeah. i yeah. have found the narrator for me so i i mean i'm wondering obviously you said you're a huge zombie fan but how did you first get connected with david well because I'm a huge zombie fan, and I, and his his original um, uh, series Autumn, um, I read all the books, and I, and I just it, the, there aren't a huge amount of zombie genre um, novels based in the UK that are good, mm. yeah. um, and there, there's, there's lots of there's lots of you know pulp, but his his really stood out. Um, and I read the book and a long time ago when he first wrote the books, when they came out, I read them then and I loved them. And then I, I was un unlucky enough, and he'll agree with this, but I was unlucky enough to see the movie that was made. Of, of <laughs> I've seen the movie too. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, it, and it was such a great, it had the potential. It had such a great cast of Dexter Fletcher, mm. right, who, who, is if you don't know him, listen to any McDonald's ad in the UK. He's the voice of McDonald's, but he's he's a brilliant actor, director, producer, writer. You know, a genius guy. Um, and and it had David Carradine. You know, Kung Fu, who is now sadly no longer with us. So you know, potential for a brilliant cast, but they went and set it in America, and it was just awful. And mm. the treatment they gave the film itself to try and make it spooky just made it look like a really bad 1980s video copy. <laughs> um, but I know David, David's got stuff, well, fingers crossed, he's got stuff in the pipeline for, for some other. Yeah. Um, but so I read those books ages ago, and it, it was a, a case of I saw that he'd rebooted the series, and I tapped him up. I sent him a message going, I see that you're rebooting the series. I love your stuff. Uh, can I audition for it? And that's that's what happened. Um, yeah. He, he put it out for general uh, audition for, 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 you know, searching for an author. And I caught it just at the right time. And I sent him a message saying, look, I've read, I've read all your existing books and the autumn books and Hater and all of those. Um, and I said, I, I'm desperate to do that. I really want to do this, you know. Um, and so I went through the audition process like everyone else. And he came back and said, I want you to do it. So, um, you know, it's 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 always if if there's a genre um, or a book that you really like and you want to do the audio book, ask, you know, get in touch with the author. And if there isn't already an audio book, you know, um, Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, of course, like, I couldn't help but notice when I looked at your website, you have a testimonial 
from Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, yeah. How did that come about? So, so it's a bit of a cheat in that, but it, but it is voice related. So for many years, I was the resident singer in what was, uh, well, it still is, but it's but it a five-star hotel in Cardiff, but it was the only five-star hotel in Cardiff, in Cardiff Bay. And it's, so it's not in the centre of in Cardiff city itself. Cardiff is in Wales, when Wales is not part of England, for anyone watching this. <laughs> um, it's, I spend time in the US and they quite often go, oh, Wales, England. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, and I would uh, sing there on a Friday evening and a Sunday lunchtime. Very posh, five, you know, um, Michelin star restaurant. I sit in the corner and croon, and there were there were a few times when I was well, more than a few times. A lot of celebrities would stay in the hotel because it was slightly out of the way, and it was the weekend of Sir Anthony Hopkins' birthday. And he'd also come to unveil a statue of Tommy Cooper, (laughs) um, who was a uh, was an English comedian. Mm. And I was singing in the bar and I was singing away and he walked in the bar and he walked past me and he stopped. And I, and I sort of looked at him and I thought, bloody hell, that's Hannibal Lecter. And, and he went forward and he just went, Aubrey, what a beautiful voice. And just carried on. And I thought, well, that's going on my website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I, they, I had a number of incidents like that. Um, I was singing one Sunday afternoon and this guy came in. He looked like a tramp, very scruffy, old. Um, and whenever I'd take a break, I'd stand on the, on the end of the bar, very long bar. I'd stand on the end out of the way. They'd pour me a drink knowing that I was about to take a, a break. So this one afternoon, this guy came in and I was just about to take a break and he stood in, in my spot. How dare he? <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, well, I, I'll go and stand on the end of the bar anyway, because I don't want to be, you know, in the way of the front of the bar with the, with the rest of the punters. I know and I stood and I went to get my drink again. and this voice from next to me, because I, I used to have a podium with my name on it. And the voice next to me went, Aubrey. You have an absolutely remarkable voice, and I turned, and it was John Hurt, the actor, um, and he was he was in Cardiff filming Doctor Who, um, and I didn't I didn't sing again that day because I spent the rest of the afternoon stood at the bar with John Hurt, drinking red wine. <laughs> so um, yeah, but but testimonials, they're really important. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, there are testimonials on my website from other authors, not not just, I mean, celebrities looks great, doesn't it? But, um, you know, uh, the, certainly as a as a an audio book narrator, probably the most important testimonials you can get are from authors that you've worked with. Mm. Um, you know, there's there's nothing better than than an author giving you a, a good recommendation, um, because, again, yeah that when you're seen to be good at what you do and successful, other people want a piece of it. So, which is always a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I note too, that you've been doing some work with Ian Rob Wright, who in terms of yeah. like, I guess the kind of independent self-publishing UK horror scene, I mean, he's right at the top of the game, you know, with, with people like David. Yeah, well, I st- I think what was the first book I did with Ian? It might have been Escape. I think it was one one of you know he he'd done he'd already done a load of books by the time we crossed paths. Again, I auditioned, um, saw the book, love I love the I love the horror genre. You know, it's it's um, if if you look at my 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 playlist on on Netflix, you mm. know, most people would run a mile. <laughs> I love all of that stuff. Um, and again, I'd read one of his books and I thought, oh, this is great. You know, this is. So it was when it came up for audition, I was like straight on it. And 
I, I remember doing, I, I think it was Escape I did first, but I did I did Escape and then I went on and did another. And he's quite prolific, Ian. You know, mm-hmm. he, he sort of, he doesn't half chewing them out. Yeah. And they're good as well. You know, they're, they're, they're great. Um, like he's, he's just, he's doing this series at the moment, the, the Lost Manuscripts. Um, so he's bringing out one every sort of two or three months. But um, I, I remember after I'd done like this sort of, second or third book for him we had a conversation and i said do you want me to do any more for you and he went what do you mean i said well if you've got any more books coming out do you, do you want me to do them or will you put them out for audition he went no he said you're, you're my narrator now you will do all my books um which was you know that, that was a that made me feel brilliant um and what what you find quite often is, you know, when you start working with an author, unless you do something really stupid, um, they you become their voice. Mm. Um, and uh, the 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 author I was telling you about earlier on, D- David David Gatwood, oh yeah, writes this Grim Up North series, uh, uh, DCI Harry Grimm, and we uh, we we had a he he did a conference last last weekend for his his readers and listeners up in Yorkshire and he he was on the podium and he was being asked questions. And, you know, I think somebody said something like, where, where does your inspiration come from? And, uh, uh, and he, he said, he's not quite sure where it all comes from, but the ideas form in his head. But he said, but when he writes, it's my voice is in his head when he writes, not his. Yeah. Which is amazing compliment, you know, um, and you know, I've had conversation with David where he said there, there can never be another author for the Grimm series. It has to be me now because everyone's so grown so used to it. But you get that with with like um, the Harry Potter series. There were a couple of different authors, but most people you'll say Harry Potter audiobooks. Oh, Stephen Fry, you know. But there were other narrators in the beginning. But he he then just became the voice of Potter, you know, um, and and people that people then they can immediately associate when a new book comes out because it's the same voice. Yeah, not not all authors are like that. I I've noticed that some authors um, they'll they'll have a different narrator for every book. That, that's that's fine, you know. I mean, if, if it's different characters and different protagonists, fine. But if you've got a if you've got characters that continue from book to book to book. I think it can could become confusing for listeners, mm. uh, um, because it was like, well, didn't 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 John have a, an American accent or a, a, a deep Southern American accent last time, and now he's from New York and his voice has gone up a couple of pitches. Yeah, you don't want to confuse people, but maybe that's just my sales pitch. <laughs> no, I mean, I I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, I mean, both as a listener and an author i mean as as a listener i want consistency yeah, <laughs> if i particularly yeah. if it if it's a series it, it's just kind of too jarring if the the accent has now switched and i'm having to yeah, keep yeah. track of things and obviously the accent can inform the character and their personality but then from a writer perspective both for myself and having spoken with other authors, it's interesting how once they've got an audio book out there, or if there's a film adaptation, if they then write a subsequent book, it's kind of an amalgamation of a sequel to their book, but also a sequel to the film or to the audio book, because once you've heard or you've seen, you you kind of can't unsee or unhear it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's... Um... Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to keep consistency. Um, mm. You know, if 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 an author writes a book and they have their own style, and the next book in the series they decide to try a different writing style, then that will equally throw the reader. So yes, you have you have to have consistency of of writing styles, consistency of characters, character voices. Unless there's some, you know, there's there's a specific reason you change a character, you know, obviously in in the world of literature, you can do whatever you want, 
because mm. you know you're not restricted by anything you, whatever your mind thinks you can you can put on the page so if a character you know transitions from being male to female then fine then that you could do so with with the narrator but um otherwise yeah you're just going to confuse the hell out of people <laughs> yeah and i'm easily yeah. confused <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> well I mean, you said that you've been interested in horror for the vast majority of your life. So I'm wondering, what were your first experiences with horror stories or horror movies? So when you were growing up, what were some of the early films and books that you read? So there were, I remember, for, for a, a couple of years during my in my childhood, I moved to mid wales i currently live near, near cardiff um and i've moved up to mid wales in, into the countryside and it, it was there i kind of got um interested in sort of ghosts and um you know the the, the whole sort of unexplained phenomena mm. um a, a, there were there was um a, a series of um claimed ufo sightings down in west wales um they they called it the green triangle um but it was it was down um sort of south south of st david's in west wales and and it was um it was quite a big thing at the time it was, it was you know i remember seeing it on john craven's news round of all places these school kids being interviewed that they'd seen a couple of um ufos and you know there's a big hullabaloo about it and w weirdly over the years that kind of kind of blew over but recently there's there's a there's a netflix documentary at the moment about the unexplained and they and they do a whole episode on what happened there um so that kind of piqued my interest in the unexplained and I guess that kind of let you know and I was there were, there were some local ghost stories I remember getting my parents to take me to this church that wasn't too far from us that, that reportedly had a you know ghost sightings um uh and I I suppose it's it's the whole romance of the unexplained um but then that kind of led into my love of horror and the first um book i remember reading that was horror um was actually um a paperback version of uh, the movie alien mm. um my my parents had bought the book because the film was out at the time so what was that 79 or something mm. and of course i couldn't go to the cinema to see her too young um so i read the book and it gave me the most horrendous nightmares. <laughs> and I remember my dad telling me off for reading the book because I nicked the book and read it. And he was like, "You, you stupid! You shouldn't have told. You shouldn't be reading that, this stuff." You know. Um, but that kind of got got my got my interest going. And then I kind of I've always been fascinated, like a lot of people are. You know, the end of the world scenarios. Um, this this imagining that you're you're the last person or, or mm. one of one of only a few left an empty world um and years later i read a book called the purple cloud which was written in like the end of the last sort of end of the 18th century i think or very early 19th century and it's it's all about a guy who is left alone on 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 the world this this purple cloud comes out of the ground and basically wipes everyone out um but but he he for various reasons he manages to survive and it's it's not so much about the the um uh the, the fact that everybody's dead and you know the calamity it's more about the, the human condition um which is very much what dave moody writes about with his mm. uh, with his novels it's the people that are left and how they behave and that's always fascinated me how will people survive 
and how will they behave? And you get, you always get this, or seem to always get this massive breakdown in society and rules, and uh, and 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 that's always fascinating me. I'm not the the zombie thing is, it just I don't know what it is. It piques my interest. Um, when it when it comes to horror, I'm not so much interested in you know mythical monsters or. Um, even a lot of sort of religious um, uh, sort of unexplained phenomena that doesn't really do it for me. You know, stuff like The Exorcist, great film, but not mm. not my bag. Yeah. Um, but when when it comes to that sort of desolation of the, of the world and what would be left behind, that that always grabs me. I don't know why. It's you know, I suppose. We, Quite often we all have this fantasy of, oh, I'm the last person left alive. What would I do? You know, mm. in, in reality, you'd be bored to death probably and <laughs> kill yourself. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, horror has been with me a long, long time. I, I Like The Walking Dead, I was getting the, the comic books when they first came out. Mm. Um Unfortunately, they they did exactly what they did to Lost with The Walking Dead. They ruined it. Um, yeah, and it just it, it just went Ugh. instead of going out with a bang, which it could have done. It it just sort of went. It's like it with a whimper, I suppose, which is a real shame. But yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I think the first few seasons of The Walking Dead were fantastic, and yeah. Yeah, <laughs> could could leave the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at that, <laughs> being the Walking Dead, that was that was good. You know, mm. that, 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 I was interested in that. Um, there, there, there are a number of books over the years that have really that I go back to. Um, I am Legend. You know, brilliant. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> so you know, good, Matheson. It was just. I mean, brilliant. If you, the, the original book is just fantastic. There's, there's various versions of that um, that have been done over the years. The the, the Will Smith movie uh, could have been a hell of a lot better, um, and they they completely bastardized the original book. That's mm. what Hollywood does, isn't it? Um, but I thought the, the 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 original book is is much more sinister. Um, and uh, you know it's a great twist on vampires, Re- really good. That that's a book that's always. Stuck. And of course, the other one is the one that really fascinated me was World War Z. World War Z. Mm. The, the, the the film was okay. Um, you know, they even based some of it in Cardiff. Uh, but um, the the original is so much better because mm. it is those accounts of lots of different people it's not just from one person's viewpoint uh, it's a journalist going around the world after the zombie wars have, have ended talking to people about key battles during you know so it really is like a a proper um war journalist diary almost um and I, that piqued my interest because it was a really unique take on on writing a you know on book mm. Um, so yeah, have I bored you enough with my? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. And I mean, I really appreciated with World War Z or World War Z, you know, the the epistolary format because I mean, we we don't see that that much in fiction anyway. I mean, an example I think of is House of Leaves by Mark Daniel Lewski, but in terms of like you know, like a, a zombie book, an apocalyptic book being told in epistolary format. There isn't anything quite like it. So, yeah, I was I was very disappointed by the movie, but I think sometimes, sometimes you get disappointed by movies because the book was so good, and so yeah. the movie then didn't in any way measure up to it. But if it had been released as any other movie without that title, yeah. then you'd have been like, yeah, all right. It, it's an average yeah. Yeah. Z- zombie movie. I mean, I, I find that with, um, I don't know if you listen to much rock or metal, but I find that sometimes with Metallica albums because it's by Metallica. <laughs> There's yeah. an expectation 
that it will be good. So when they put something merely competent or okay out, it's like, oh, it's a bit yeah. disappointing. But if it hadn't been Metallica, you'd be like, oh, sounds like this band has something. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, I, I think certainly with World War Z, they would have been better off serializing it. And yeah. Turning- you could have you could have turned that into a six part series. Um, yeah, and it would have been epic if it was done in that style. You know, with the various battles for each uh, each section. But yeah, that that's Hollywood for you. It's um, you know they 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 don't often uh, reproduce a book faithfully. It's very rarely. I mean, look what they did with the Hobbit. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was, the one of the the first ever audio books, although it was done as an audio play that I ever heard, was The Hobbit, done by the BBC. Um, and then they did Lord of the Rings. And I used mm-hmm. to have the the whole series on a on cassette and came yeah. box about that big with yeah. like twenty cassettes in it. Um, uh, but that was abridged. Um, um, but it was still brilliant. Um, because it followed the story in the way the story was meant to be followed. Then they make then they make the movie, certainly of The Hobbit, and they turn it into three films. And yeah. it was like, why? There was no need to do that whatsoever. Dragged it out, made it boring mm. for people. Um, and I and I don't understand why they they did that. It's like, how much can we rinse out of this? You know. Yeah. <laughs> out of this franchise um but you know and that which kind of surprised me because because you know peter jackson he he makes good films uh, you know he's a bloody good director oh but yeah he, he was obviously told no we need to we need to make some money out of this and serialize the book into three parts and and oh by the way we're going to introduce a load of stuff that was mentioned one line in the Hobbit, you know, yeah, it's like he's going to go off for for, and we'll see him in three months' time, and that became a book, a whole bloody, you know, <laughs> separate film. And it's like, oh my god! But there we go. Yeah, yeah. My cynical take on life. Yeah, I mean Peter Jackson. Now he's obviously most known for Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, but I mean. Back in the day, like his early roots, there was some extreme horror and brain oh, dead. And I, I I'd love to see him return to that. I mean, it's probably not quite the aesthetic that he's going for these days. But but equally, it's like he's got enough money. So if he wanted to, he just could. He doesn't have to take a film to make money at this no, point. No, that's right. And and when you look at films like Brain Dead, um, which on the surface, seems like a superficial, low-budget horror film. Um, it's actually bloody genius, that film. Yeah. You know, and yes, they did make it on a low budget, but it's 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 an absolute classic gore-fest film. Yeah. You know, the, the, I mean, it's horror, but it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Know? It's yeah. like when they when they did the um I know it's not Peter Jackson, but when they did the 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 uh was it was it Night of the Living Dead? The it was the comedy kind the of The Return of the Living Dead. Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. I mean that film was just brilliant. You know, yeah. the way it was, it was tongue in cheek, but you know, there were moments in it that were like, Oh, oh my god. You know. It's there's there's, there's that scene at the beginning where where the the gas escapes from the pod and um they're in the it's like a supply um warehouse for um it's obviously for like universities so it's full of cadavers and split dogs and butterflies and it's just that scene where they all start coming back to life it's like oh my god that turned my stomach you know the split dog sort of whimpering (laughs) yeah (laughs) It's, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's the very very little things in a movie or a book that c- sort of create these all this imagery in your head and make you go oh god I don't like that 
you know, not necessarily the big effects of somebody's head exploding, like scanners or something, you know. Yeah. That was shocking. But, um, yeah, it's the little nuances they put in films, I think. Mm. Which, uh, if you, sometimes you can watch a movie, can't you? And then you can watch it again. You go, oh, I missed that bit. Oh, I didn't see yeah. that. Bit. Or, you know, I love all of that. It's... Yeah, I think it can catch you off guard as well if you've got a particularly horrific moment in something that is tonally more a comedy and then equally if you've got something that is pretty brutal or just harrowing and then they add some humor so yeah i mean yeah yeah yeah, i'm always interested in how people kind of strike the balance between humor and horror and you know what it looks like from writer to writer and obviously that was something i was conscious of with house of bad memories as well yeah yeah i i I think um i've got a few friends who are who've who've seen quite a bit of active service as as uh, british soldiers and they they talk about this this gallows humor in that you know in even in the worst most horriblest of situations someone will crack a joke um and it's you you get the same in in movies where something terrible can happen and then something funny counteracts it and i think that's human nature um and it's and it's a good way of sort of connecting with with your audience if you do that you know for for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction and um i mean some films are just complete and utter gore fests aren't they but right quite often there will be there will be a moment of you know laugh out loud stupidness in a in a in an awful film um it was uh like that that scene in alien um i watched my partner had never seen it so we watched alien the other day and i didn't tell her about the where, where the xenomorph bursts out of um uh, John, uh, John Hurt's chest. Yeah, and um, you know she jumped, and and I, just, I said to her, when they made the film, nobody knew apart from John Hurt that that was going to happen. You know, obviously the special effects people did, but the actors didn't, um, and it was done purposely to get the reaction that he got off off the off the actors. You know, um, and those sort of. Uh, but but then but then the alien pops out and it sort of and it just looks really funny you know when it pops out and then it shoots off and it's like you got those two horrible moments or that that horrible moment offset by oh well, look at that stupid little alien and it makes a stupid noise like like a fart and shoots off you know um, and I, it's a good balance to have in in you know horror and you know with House of Bad Memories. There, there are some quite harrowing, you know, bits in that book, but they are offset with these lighter moments, and almost mm. you know, some of the characters, they're just comic, not comical in a in a bad way. They, they, the 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 things they say and do just make you sort of giggle, you know. Yeah, uh, which which I, I'm hoping that was your intention. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I know. You know, I I mean, I've got quite a bit of early reader reaction and it it is delightful for me to see like quite a few people saying Jade is their favourite character. (laughs) You know, if she was my sister, I I, I don't know. I I don't know what I'd do if she was my sister. She's just, she's obviously heart of gold, you know. Yeah. Christ, she's annoying. (laughs) But, you know, but that's, that's your... That that's your sort of one of your lighter elements, you know, the, and the things she says, yeah, um, you know, they do they make me giggle, they, they really do. She 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 was a joy to do, yeah. Uh, I I am concerned slightly that some people will go, and this is something that's very hard for a narrator to do when you're a bloke is getting women's voices right, right. And normally, all I will do is soften my voice and soften my sibilance sibilance to soften the s's you know? yeah 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 that's all i will do for female voices because in the past people have gone 
oh, you're just trying to do a woman's voice and you sound all high pitched and it's really annoying. But that's Jade. Jade is high pitched and really annoying. So I did a voice like that, but I'm I kind of I'm worried a little bit that some people go, oh God, I can't stand listening to that bloody woman's voice. But that's that's her. Yeah. That's, that, you know, she is that person. She's if you were if you were in a if you're in a room or if you're in a supermarket, there would be one voice standing out above the rest and it would be Jade's. You know? Yeah. So it's a. Uh, I, I love characters like that. You know, you can get your teeth into them um, and ham it up a bit, which is what I've done with Jade. Yeah. I mean, writing Jade and Gaza was like the most fun part of the book for me really and <laughs> you know it's good to hear that it, it seems to be one of the most fun parts you, you know for for readers as well i mean there are a few specific scenes that i really enjoyed writing but i i don't want to mention them because then i'm going to spoil things and it's like i want people to organically get to those bits yeah 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 I mean, I think I think we can we can one thing that we can safely say is that Gaz is a bit of a lummox, really, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, and, and you and you kind of feel sorry for him. Um, yeah, but but um, yeah, the the way you wrote that character um, is you you do have empathy for him, and in fact, yeah. you have empathy for Jade. Yeah, yeah because because she she she, she is this. You know, she's got a big heart, really. She's just really bloody annoying with it. But 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 we all know people like that. Yeah. We all know people that are that are really quite loud and and out there and over the top. But really, they just, you know, they. I I have a friend and he's very much like that. And I always describe him. I say, oh yeah, heart of gold, knob of butter. You know, he's <laughs> he's he's um. He's, he's well-meaning um, and wouldn't wouldn't do anything to hurt anyone, um, and yet annoying. So, I mean, for people who are just starting to work with a narrator, what tips do you have for them to have a successful collaboration? And then, on the flip side, what kind of things are you doing? to ensure you have a successful collaboration with the writer? Um, communication is really important. Some people um, take a script and, and they never speak to the author and work on it and hand it back. And then the author says, but the main protagonist was from London, not from Scotland. Oh, shit. So they just wasted a load of time. So it's really important that as a narrator, I speak to the author. Um, like I said, I, I send out a, um, character sheets for people to fill out um, so that I've and, and I've learned that through making that mistake by, by, by giving, you know, giving a character a certain characteristics and the author going no that's not what i meant um and then you have to go back and re-record everything so <clears throat> to to make sure you're both singing off the same hymn sheet um you need to have that that conversation and that relationship with the author um ask questions of the author um if there are any words that you're not sure of or not sure how are pronounced ask the author um but though, be, be, so being prepared is is the main. Uh, I, I think is the is 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 the key fact, um, and then likewise as a narrator, you know, you have to ask questions of 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 the author, and and let them ask questions back. I mean, um, it, it may be, for example, that the author says, um, you know, this this is set in. America, how's your American accents? Don't lie and say, oh, yeah, my American accents are great. <laughs> and you can't do an American accent. You know, that's no good for anyone. Um, <clears throat> and if something is beyond, if you think something's beyond your ability, then don't don't take the job. Um, and the same goes for 
if you get a script of somebody um, or you're doing the audition and you think, oh, this is a boring book, then don't do it because that will come across in your narration. Um, you, you have to be invested in what you're doing and enjoy what you're doing. And it does happen sometimes where, you know, I'll take on a book because you you when you audition, you only have a small section of the book to audition to. But normally that's that's enough to get get the gist of whether the writer's any good for starters and what the story's like. Um, but sometimes you can take on a book and it's full of mistakes or it's badly written or, you know, and in those instances, that makes the job hard. Um, I haven't, I, I, I haven't yet turned somebody down and gone. No, I can't do this because that's the whole point of vetting the the job in the first place. What I have done is I did work with one author who was just unreasonable um, and was demanding that basically that that which I guess is is an author's right. But he was demanding that he had full control over the way that I performed the audiobook, how I said things, uh, what was said, um, the, um, the, 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 the way some of the lines were, were spoken, the intonation, everything. He just wanted control of everything. And we fell out um, while, whilst I, I, I got right to the end of the book and he just kept coming back saying, I want it done this way, I want it done this way. And in the end, I literally had to say to him, you need to narrate your own books because nobody is going to get what you're trying, you know, what you want. Nobody's going to be able to do it in the way that you want. Um, that's the cordial version of the conversation. <laughs> the actual conversation didn't quite go like that. Yeah. It involved with him calling me, some very nasty words <laughs> and, and my response was i never want to work with you ever again and i dissolved the contract yeah um, there's no need to be unreasonable with people yeah it's a book at the end of the day yeah um, it's a story it's and it's entertainment um so um yeah i mean do your research ask questions and um do, and 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 do it to do, you know when when you're if you're an audiobook narrator like like I am who produces all their own work as well just know your stuff know how to use your equipment know how to produce know how to get the files in the right format at the right levels and whatever platform you're producing for they all have different technical requirements so if you're producing for for ACX, which is the part of um, uh, Amazon or Audible, mm. uh, that, that is like the background side of it. They're very, very specific about their file requirements. The site, the um, the uh, basically the sound levels have to be within a very small region of error. Uh, other sites, they're, they're a lot more lax with stuff like that. They, they don't care so much because they do their own processing. But um, so, so know your equipment um, and understand what you're doing. There's nothing worse than starting work on a project and then realizing you don't know how to use the software that you've got properly because that just slows the whole thing down. So, um, yeah, ask questions. Know your shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I was speaking to David Moody yesterday because he, he was kind enough to blurb House of Bad Memories. So I've tried to get like a number of people on who have been kind of instrumental in the release of the book. And so we, we spoke briefly about your audio book narration. And of course, I said to him, like, oh, you know, that there, there were moments where it's like I knew I was being a little bit pedantic and it's like, God, I hope that I don't piss Aubrey off. But equally, like I, I wanted to raise things. But at the same time, if you said no, that that's enough. And like, I, I guess it's like it's always a bit of a balance. And I think I think it's harder the first time 
you work with someone so that now that we've worked together I think fingers crossed that I know kind of what is and isn't reasonable to query yeah. you know g- going forward but I, I mean, you you as a, as a as a narrator you you have to have you have to gain the trust of the author that they trust you mm. to to know what you're doing um and you, there will always be instances where the author goes can we you know can we tweak that can we change that mm. in, in 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 your case the um the accuracy of the text to the speech you're absolutely right and you have full control over that and you know you are well within your right to say no i you know i want it said exactly as it is written on the page one thing that um i do say to authors is sometimes what is written on the page doesn't convert well to speech mm. for example um if i was to say um you or if the text said you are going to do what i tell you in reality, people would say, you're going to do what I tell you. They wouldn't go, you are going to do, you know, they, they shorten little bits. So that, that has to be taken into consideration. However, um, you know, like I said, it's your book, it's your baby. Um, you know, you, 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 yes, you have, you, you were right in what you were doing. Um, I, it's not very often I come across somebody that goes into that level of, um correctiveness but that's fine that's all part of the job um technically uh if you there's a thing called whisper sync right which, yeah um which is where some readers will listen to the audiobook at the same time as reading it not many but some do um so you want it to be the same but whisper sync allows for 96% accuracy so you can have four percent worth of mistakes, which is a hell of a lot when you when you actually look at it. It's something like it's something ridiculous, like one in twenty words. You know, it's, right? It's a lot, isn't it? But as long as you're not changing any of the context or the meaning, um, you know, to as as a narrator, you, you know, you do kind of sometimes abbreviate words or sometimes. Mm. You will transpose two words, but they mean exactly the same. Um, the the meaning doesn't change, um, but it, you know, a, a, yeah, accuracy, accuracy is is really important. And there's, and it's funny because it really varies from author to author and from publishing house to publishing house. There are some publishing houses that I work for, and they. They kind of they'll do a superficial check on your uh, on on your work, and they'll come back and they'll say, "Oh, can you just change that, that, and that?" You know, not not much at all. Whereas others, um, they they want it word perfect, absolutely word perfect, and that lengthens the whole production process a lot. But you know, it's they they're right to do it. It's you know, yeah, it is right. It's um, um but of course if you're if you're working to time constraints sometimes you have to go okay well we'll we'll put up with that two or three percent you know of errors it's um because to to uh to err is to be human <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean the the way that like i'm trying to look at it as well is like it's almost like the audiobook it is an adaptation in the same way that a film is an adaptation. It's just a much closer adaptation to the text. But yeah, whisper sync is something that I'm very aware of. And so actually that was why so much kind of detail was yeah. coming down. Cause I didn't want like whisper sync to reject it, but you know, with with that margin for error and now almost like rewiring my brain to be like, it's okay. It's an adaptation. And obviously, you know, when you're changing things, 
the vast majority of the time. That's not a mistake. That is a conscious choice that you know you're making. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It, it 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 is very important that you don't change any of the context or meanings. Mm. You can't. Yeah. Um, sometimes you you know you come across errors that the author's made. Um, and, and do you know one of the most common ones I come across is a character will have been called John all the way through the book, and then all of a sudden, his name is James. Yeah, and that happens more often than you than you'd expect, and it's obviously something in the author's brain. They, they quite you know quite often authors write quite fast, and um, mm. and they mistype a name. Or they, or they give the character the wrong name and you have to go back and go, eh, I'm a bit confused here. And if I'm confused, the reader's going to be confused. But this character's name, you know, and, and you pick up little bits like that sometimes. Sometimes you, you pick up on bad grammar or a sentence mm. might have been constructed incorrectly. And it's okay to go back to the author and point that out to them. Mm. Occasionally, they, that's, they may fully well in, have intended to do that for whatever yeah. reason. But um, it's okay to point them out. What, one job that is that is not ours as narrators is to edit. That's not mm. our job. Yeah, of so, course. You know, if something is wrong, it's not. We can fix it if it's just a little thing. Like if if the name was wrong and I could see that it was wrong, mm. I would change the name to be the right name. But I'd say to the author, on page such and such, line whatever, you got the, the name was wrong. Is that correct? Um, but you never ever change anything other than a glaring mistake. Um, and, and like I said, you know, we're, we're not editors. We, we, we will faithfully reproduce what's written on the page. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it can be tempting to leave the mistake in. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's a bit cruel really, you know, cause we all make mistakes. So you either change it or you just double check with the author. And, um... Yeah, yeah. And to to write as I mean something that I I try to do. I don't always do it, but you know, as my final pass on a book, and as you probably can tell, I'm quite meticulous. But I try to read everything aloud because in reading it aloud, I can then notice. Not not even necessarily a mistake, but if there's like a repetition or something doesn't quite flow right. So I think that is like a good tip for, yeah. for writers. But like the, there were even, you know, some things in, in hearing you read it where like I hadn't picked up on me reading it because I guess like it gives you that distance and it was yeah. like, ah, yeah. should have yeah. done this, like. You know, I noticed some things that I just left in and I was like, oh, I repeated that word a little bit too close together. But I yeah. am also aware that my brain is a, like not everyone is going to be like, well, you repeated that word two no. sentences in a row. Yeah, you yeah. spoiled the book. Yeah. No, yeah. No, that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that that uh, it's it's interesting, isn't it? That that hearing a book. Uh, out loud mm. uh, can can often change even the author's perception of the way that the books uh, the book was originally intended. Um, the, I, I mentioned earlier on that you know books were were once were always read out loud, um, mm. and in doing so, books were quite often written to be read out loud, mm. and then. Then things changed and people started reading silently, reading to themselves. How annoying would it be if you were sat on the tube yeah. and reading out loud, right? Um, so, so people went to silent reading, which I think changed the way authors wrote. Mm. They then wrote books that were meant to be read, not yeah. read out loud, if that makes sense. Now we've come full circle. And because of audio books, and I've had, you know, I've had this discussion with a number of authors where they have changed slightly their style of writing mm. to 
to reflect the fact that the book will be read out loud. And, yeah. you know, people use colloquialisms. They they do shorten words and hyphenate mm. sentences. And so, so sent- especially in speech, mm. sentence structure becomes very important because you can't have a sentence with 50 words in it. And yeah. the word it's too long, and it goes, and the sentence keeps going on and yeah. on, and you never get to the end of the bloody <gasps> sentence. And you, you know, so you people talk. I mean, I I can talk, but people talk in sporadic bursts. They take breaths, mm. they pause, they think about what they're going to say. And in writing, you be, because more and more books are now being converted into audio books or. or released as uh, you know as audiobooks you you have to think about that when you're writing a character's when a character's speaking what's mm. the character thinking what are they you know the, and those little pauses that people put in a sentence as they're trying to think of what to say all of that's got to be instilled in the in the text um and that you know that then makes it easier again for the narrator to go, oh, I can see exactly what they're getting at here. I can see what mm. they, I can see the way they want the character to speak, um, and, and instilling emotion. You know, it's not. It's you can't just say. Um, uh, a character saying something, for example, I hate the way you do that. It really annoys me. You know. This is somebody who's fucking angry, you know. They, mm. they, 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 they potentially could hurt the person they're talking. Mm. I hate the way you say that. You fucking annoy me, you know. The, uh, so, to instill that in the text, you have to think about, well, how am I going to write this that conveys the fact that this person is really angry? Yeah. Um, without just saying he was really, really angry when he <laughs> said it, you know, it, 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 because then. Then it becomes like writing a flipping Janet and John book, or a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, it's it's better to sometimes it's better to imply than just make a statement, you know. Yeah, get emotion across more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I personally try to minimize my dialogue tags as well, and I think it's like a kind of mistake I see, particularly new authors make that there are far too many <laughs> dialogue tags and like you you know like if there's two people talking you really don't need many reminders at all and it's particularly distracting if you know that there's they're not just he said she said but it's like he bellowed and it's like well instead of that give us an action give us a yeah. context yeah. so that it can be inferred but yeah it's, again this is um a conversation I've had with a number of authors in that sometimes because they put all of those statements in that he said, he said, she said, it becomes quite boring and repetitive when you're reading the book out loud. And yeah. there have been instances where I've said to the author, look, we know who's talking because John has a British accent and Sarah's American. You yeah. Know? That will that will come across in the text. The listener can hear that. I don't need to say he said, she said. So I'll, te- I'll, I'll remove those from the text because it makes the conversation flow. Yeah. Um, and, and it becomes much more natural, he said. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So not always, but especially if you've got characters and it's obvious who's speaking you know, by their accent or their character or whatever, then I will, I, I, I'll check with the author, but I will often remove those. Um, and as a consequence, authors are now sort of going, I don't need to use those all the time. You know, it can occasionally be a little bit confusing. Mm. You have lines of text and you're thinking, well, who's speaking? I don't know who's speaking. But what that does is it makes you go back and reread and work out who's speaking. And then, you know, that's fine. That's, uh, but um, 
it's it's yeah it's interesting that 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 whole he said she said thing is um yeah yeah, yeah I'm... kind of changing writers right writer styles i suppose with audio yeah. i mean my general rule is if i don't absolutely need a dialogue tag then i try not to have one yeah i mean it yeah it can be difficult because like there can be no way around if you've got like a, a massive scene with a lot of different people then you kind of yeah. need to throw that in but then ev even then rather than he said or she said i'll give a little action or something just to try and make it less monotonous and <laughs> you yeah. know more enjoyable for the readers the listeners for all concerned yeah 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 and i mean if there's only two characters yeah and you're okay you know you can get away with that but even that can sometimes cause confusion because you might have a character that will say something mm. and then they might pause and then you might have a new line with quotes and they say something else and it's the same character and as the narrator you're is that the character say still speaking or is it the other character yeah, speaking? You know, yeah. So you have to be careful with that but yeah uh, I mean, I think as long as you keep the pause on the same line, then it then it's okay. Yeah. Of course, it becomes it becomes difficult when occasionally the formatting is as such that the pause comes right at the end of a line. Yeah. So yeah. you've written it, but it's now on the next one. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that that happens. But so so again, that that comes down to the narrator. You keep your wits about you when you're mm. when you're narrating. You can't just regurgitate words. Um, so, so, you know, you you have to you have to have a vested interest in the story, so that it makes sense. So that so that you're putting the right um, intonation in into those words. Um, yeah. If you if you're just reading, like AI. Then there, there, there will be no emotion. You're just yeah. reading the words on the page, and there, and a bomb goes off, and they all die. You know, it's <laughs> there's no where's the there's no emotion in that, is there? So yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of creatives, whether you know, narrators, writers, artists, are rightfully worried about AI, but I feel. That like, you know, if you're not creating something soulless, if you're injecting your own unique personality into it, then like for the time being, at least we're the ones who don't have to worry about our jobs. If if you're doing something by the numbers, then OK, I can see that it's a, a threat. But it, if you're doing it by the numbers anyway, why are you doing it? <laughs> if you're doing it purely for financial reasons, I don't know what to say, but there are a lot of other monotonous <laughs> careers that will pay you much better. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there's the the tech, you see on TikTok all the time. There's a load of people out there going, uh, "Do you want to do you want the the latest side hustle where you can make a thousand dollars a day even when you're asleep?" all you need is some AI and you can make a book and stick it on Amazon and great. You know, any monkey can do that. Um, companies like Amazon are turning AI created books away. They don't yeah. want them. Um, because in the long run, there's software out there that will write a novel for you. It is there. It exists. Chat GDP, the various uh, uh, iterations of it. You can type in your synopsis and it will write a book. Yeah, there is now software that does the same for screenwriting. I I saw that yesterday for the first time. You put your idea in, and it'll write you five scripts, and the, you know, to for a TV show, for a TV series, it'll create the plot lines, the characters, the backstory. It'll do everything. How boring is that? Also, what will happen over a period of time, and this is the danger of AI: is all AI can do is go out and look at what's already there, collate it, and use what's there to make your story, right? Which initially people go, wow, that's awesome. I can write a book in minutes. Yeah. 
But over a very short period of time, all those books are going to sound like the same book. Yeah. With the same plot lines, with the same stories, with the same names. Because you'll just be generating books that will be going out there, created by AI, that AI is looking at to create its new book. So it's it's like the gene pool. It's like what happens if a brother marries a sister. You know, right. the offspring are going to be some kind of weird looking, you know, and they were, and something won't be right with it. And that's exactly what will happen with AI if everyone starts using it to write books. And it will become very, very noticeable. And they'll be very, very boring and predictable. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole point of, um, of any of the arts is the fact that you create, you have the ability to create something from nothing. And as, who was it? I don't know if it was John Lennon or somebody once said, it doesn't matter what you imagine, if you can think it, you can create it. Mm. You know, people, people used to sort of talk back, back in, you know, the very, very early days of science fiction, laser guns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was, there, there was never going to be a laser gun. But there is now. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the possibility of multiple universes. That is no such thing. Well, now they're realizing, you know, quantum physics, entanglement. If we can think it, it can happen. And the same goes for literature. Um, you can paint glorious pictures. You can design you can, worlds, billions of light years across the universe with creatures that breathe coal. I don't know. You know, all of this can be done in within your own mind. Um, and using AI to write a book is just, it's cheating, but also it, all you're doing is, is thinning out the gene pool. Um, yeah. And, 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 and kind of destroying that art that, you know, if we're not careful, the, the, sort of the writing of books could become a lost art it could mm, you know yeah and the same goes with 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 acting and actors and voice actors and all of these jobs that can be done by ai but will never have the human emotion that's required to make a great story great you know to make a story make somebody turn somebody to jelly and cry with emotion you know uh ai could write an approximation of that but who wants that you know it's like it's like having banana flavored sweets you know yeah. they taste a bit like, like bananas but they're fucking horrible you know give me a banana any day mind you say that bananas themselves are modified aren't they so that's <laughs> You know, you know what I mean. You know, it's, yeah. There's nothing better than the real thing. So yeah, those were literature. Yeah. Well, I think that is a pretty wonderful note, really, to go out on. So, I mean, thank you so much for all your time this morning that you've been chatting with me for. It's been a real pleasure to get to chat to you, to get to know you. A little bit better and you know you've been so generous with your insights and knowledge so thank you My very pleasure. much Th thanks for thanks for putting up with me and um <laughs> i hope your your ears haven't fallen off yet i can't see because you've got headphones on <laughs> probably well, talk them off so uh... <laughs> that, that is a, a mystery that will remain then <laughs> we'll, we'll never know yeah but I um where where can the listeners connect with you or like is there somewhere if they're interested in working with you that they could send yeah. a query are you open to queries at the yes. moment yeah i am um more than happy you know if anybody wants any uh, help or advice i'm more than happy to give it um you can there's there's a number of ways you can find me on facebook you can, if you Google me, you can find Aubrey Parsons voiceover. That'll find me. Or you can go to vo-artist.com. That's vo for voiceover-artist.com. That's my, that's my main website. 
Um, if you're interested in the music that I've done over the years, you can just just type Aubrey Parsons singer, and you'll find me. So there you go. All right. Available, available now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts to leave the listeners with? Um, yeah. You can call me what you like, but don't call me in the morning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, mate.